Welcome back to Quantum Mechanics for the Working Professional. This is a course meant to take folks with a mild technical background through the rudiments of quantum mechanics and quantum computing. I'm Sean, I'm your guide through this material, and in this, our second section, we'll be discussing physical observables and how they can be modeled as linear operators. Specifically, we're going to be learning about, one, what a physical observable is, two, how to think of it as a linear operator acting on a space of quantum states, you know, those things we studied last time, and three, we'll learn how to take the expectation value of an observable operator. As always, there will be write-ups online to accompany this lecture. Uh, we'll post them in the show notes below. Included in that will be some recommendations for further reading and some references, as well as exercises, which I strongly recommend that you attempt as a way to kind of assess your understanding of this material. If you haven't registered for the course yet, I'd strongly encourage you to do so. Uh, it's free, after all, um, and especially if you need some kind of accountability mechanism to help push you through this material, we can offer that for you. Uh, additionally, we'll give you uh, extra information from time to time about what's going on and, and uh, bonus material, th those kinds of things. All right, great. So without further ado, let's get started. Last time, we saw that silver atoms, like electrons or protons, have two spin states, up and down. We modeled this two-level system as a column vector, so that a generic spin state was specified by two constants, alpha and beta. So this vector, or ket, psi, was given by alpha up plus beta down. The actual spin of those silver atoms is encoded in this state vector, but the actual value of spin is accessed by the operator, or matrix, S sub Z. Here I'm writing S sub Z as we might imagine the stern gerlock measuring the spin of the atoms along the Z direction in, in three dimensions. Just a choice, just a convention. That level of detail will be important later, but for now the point is that the effect of the stern gerlock magnet is baked into the operator, S Z. Here we might see that the matrix has two elements, diagonal elements, which encode the actual spin values of the silver atoms, h-bar over 2 and minus h-bar over 2. Quick computations show that SZ acting on the spin-up state returns the first of these two values. As an exercise, just to make sure you know what's going on, you might verify that SZ acting on the spin-down state returns minus h-bar over 2. Incidentally, these values um, these constant values, these are the possible observations that you can make with a physical observable, uh, are sometimes called eigenvalues. This structure of having a matrix act on a vector, which gives you a constant times that same vector back, is something that mathematicians call the eigenvalue problem. Uh, the precise problem is solving for what those vectors are and what those constants are, but this is uh, more detail than we need right now. Um, we'll get into all that stuff later, uh, but it's worth pointing out so that you can familiarize yourself with the structure, because after all, learning is nothing if not an iterative process. Given the effect of the operator SZ on the spin up and spin down basis vectors, it's easy to guess what the effect on a generic vector or ket psi is. As a column vector, that's h bar over 2 with alpha and now minus beta as the components. Let's talk very briefly about a convention, a calculational convention, that'll make our lives a lot easier moving forward. It's called the normalization convention. That is, we simply demand that our constants alpha and beta always square sum to 1. Uh, that is, we assume the magnitude of a generic vector psi is always equal to 1. As you might recall from the exercises, multiplying a constant by a whole quantum state vector has no effect on the underlying probability distributions. Here we're just setting things up so that we don't have to worry about all these divided by the inner product of psi with itself factors. In other words, under this convention the probability of finding a state in the up configuration is just mod alpha squared. The denominator is always just equal to 1. Similarly, the probability of finding the state in the spin-down configuration is just mod beta squared. See? Much easier.
speaking of probability, this is one of the quirks of quantum mechanics. You cannot model the universe precisely. You cannot predict with precision what is going to happen all the time. All we can say is what can happen. This fact drove scientists nuts at the turn of the 20th century because they were used to being able to, at least in principle, predicting, using science to predict the future, to predict what happens. Uh, <laughs> But what quantum mechanics tells us is that this is not possible. And the reason it's not possible is because the universe just simply doesn't know what the future is going to be. So like I said, we can't predict everything in the universe with perfect precision. But what we can do is tell you what the possible outcomes are. Just like we spoke about last time, this is a data storage issue. The universe just doesn't have that much information baked into it. A particle can only hold so much information. So quantum mechanics presents us with a new kind of scientific theory. One that doesn't predict the outcome of the future based on some precise mathematical equations. Instead, it gives us the precise possible outcomes and the precise probabilities of each one of those outcomes possibly occurring. So we can't know if a silver atom will be measured as a spin up or down state ahead of time. If we perform a thousand or a million such measurements, we can ask what the average value will be. Given a linear operator like our matrix S sub Z, the statisticians have a concept of expectation value, which asks, given a large number of measurements, what's a typical value that we might expect? The expectation value of the operator S in the state psi is defined to be the inner product of psi with SZ acting on psi. In other words, it's the inner product of the state psi with itself with an SZ matrix sandwiched in between. The point about the choice of quantum state is so important that I'm going to repeat it. The expectation value of an operator depends explicitly upon the choice of state that you're in. Now, like we mentioned, that denominator is just equal to 1. So we can compute using the results that we've already seen. Since up and down are orthogonal states, or kets, this simplifies to h bar over 2 times the quantity mod alpha squared minus mod beta squared. To get a sense of what all this means, let's do some examples. Example 1, the spin up state. Let's suppose we ask, what is the expectation value of the operator SZ in the spin up state? This would be the state of the silver atom, say, just after it was deflected upwards by the stern gerlach device. Well, hey, that's easy enough. In a spin-up state, alpha is 1 and beta is 0, so the expectation value is just h bar over 2. Which is the literal definition of spin-up. That is to say, how much angular momentum, spin angular momentum, a given two-level particle system has, like silver atoms or an electron, h bar over 2. Positive h bar 2, of course, because it's spin-up. As a second example, we'll consider this spin down state, and it proceeds similarly. Here now beta is equal to 1 and alpha is equal to 0, so that the average value of spin angular momenta is just minus h bar over 2. It's the same amount of angular momentum as a spin up state, just in a different direction, hence the minus sign. Finally, let's consider the totally random state. Do you remember the silver atoms coming out of the oven in the stern gerlach experiment? They were spinning in any which random direction, a fact that we could model by setting alpha equal to beta, say. Note that because of our normalization convention, alpha squared plus beta squared equals 1. So we can achieve this state by setting alpha equal to beta equal to 1 over the square root of 2. Although the actual value doesn't really matter, it's alpha squared minus beta squared which gives us... 0. In other words, the average value of spin angular momentum observed in silver atoms coming out of the stern gerlach experiment is 0. But notice, that does not mean that each individual atom usually has 0 angular momentum. Quite the contrary. They must either be spin up or spin down. Their angular momentum must be equal to plus h bar over 2 or minus h bar over 2 individually. It's just that either case is equally likely. If you were to do a billion experiments, about half of them would be spin up and half of them would be spin down. And you computed these uh, precise probabilities as an exercise last time. In other words, we have a bimodal distribution of spin values. And that's kind of the trouble with the idea of an expectation value. It's just a single number, and a single number doesn't really capture everything about a physical system.
Not every matrix is an observable in quantum mechanics, but for our two-level system here, every observable is representable by a matrix, a two-by-two -two matrix. We'll learn more about the details of how those representations work in later videos. Given an observable matrix O, we can define its expectation value similarly. For a simple example of a different operator, consider the matrix defined by SZ squared. We can compute that matrix using the standard rules of matrix multiplication, and it's a good exercise to do so. Pulling those two h bars over 2s out, that gives us h bar squared over 4, and those two matrices that are left multiply to form 1 and 1, the identity matrix. So the expectation value of SC squared in a generic quantum state psi is just h bar squared over 4, regardless of the state. Isn't that wild? Every single two-level system has the same expectation value of SZ squared. And importantly, it's non-zero. As we shall soon see, this is no accident. It's a crucial feature of spin in quantum mechanics. Another topic that we'll talk about today from probability theory is that of statistical variance. Specifically, we'll learn how to compute the statistical variance of any operator such as SZ uh, for a generic quantum state. Now, if you know anything about statistics or the normal distribution or the Gaussian distribution, you know that the normal or Gaussian distribution, uh, the bell curve, if you like, can be parameterized by two numbers. One, the average value or the mean, which is what we've called the expectation value, and that's where the bell curve sits. Uh, and then the second parameter is the variance, which tells you how wide or spread out that bell curve is. Of course, the variance means something very precise for the specific case of the normal distribution, but never mind those details. Another bit of statistical nomenclature is that sometimes we call the square root of the variance uh, the standard deviation. So we present measured values as the mean or expectation value, plus or minus one of the standard deviations. Besides, you're working professionals, you're sophisticated mathematically to some extent, right? I'm sure that you've already dealt with probability and statistics in some, some capacity. The variance of SC, or indeed any operator, is defined to be the expectation value of SC squared minus the square of the expectation value of SC. It's represented mathematically by that triangle or delta symbol there. So for a generic quantum state psi, a good exercise is to compute delta SZ and show that it's equal to h bar squared over 4 times mod alpha squared times mod beta squared. And here's a hint to help you show that result. Recall that because of the normalization convention, mod alpha squared plus mod beta squared equals 1. Since 1 times 1 is also 1, you can consider mod alpha squared plus mod beta squared whole quantity squared to represent one as well. Okay, let's do one last set of examples in computing the variance of a quantum state. Once again, for example one, consider the spin up state. Here we find the statistical variance to be precisely zero. Why would that be the case? Why is that? Because beta is zero. And this has the interesting implication that the statistical variance of any measurement set of this quantum state is precisely zero, because we know what the state is precisely. It's the spin up state. In other words, statistical variance comes into play only if you're in a superposition of two orthogonal basis states. For the spin down state, the same thing is true. Alpha is zero, so the variance is zero. Again, our quantum state is definite. It's a definite configuration of one specific basis state, the spin down state. Finally, we come to the state where alpha equals beta, which was our model for that totally disordered random states coming out of the stern gerlach experiment's silver atom oven. Since alpha equals beta, the variance is just h bar squared times mod alpha to the fourth power. And again, by the normalization convention, we know that alpha and beta are both equal to 1 over the square root of 2. The variance is therefore h bar squared over 4. And it's not hard to convince yourself that this is the maximum possible variance any state in a two-level system could possibly have. Finally, we remark that for the normal distribution anyway, a standard deviation is defined to be the square root of the variance. So for the case of the maximally disordered state, the case of the silver atoms coming out of the oven, the standard deviation is h bar over 2. So the measured value 
of the spin of a silver atom or any other kind of spin one half system is literally zero plus or minus h bar over two, which is exactly <laughs> the measurement, at least for this for this two level system. And that's the end of section two. Next time, in section three, we'll dig a little deeper into the concepts of angular momentum, especially as linear operators, and specifically learn about the Pauli matrices. See you then.